So once again, we're back to our empathy series on session four. And again, our, our empathy, empathy series is focused on the book Unselfie by Michelle Borba. And let me make sure I think the view here, make sure I've got the right view. Okay. Yeah, my view is a little bit different here. Jamie, how is your setup? Is that seeing you and I see myself and the other participant yeah. is like little at the top. Yep, that sounds great. So so the focus today is on self-regulation. And I think this is a huge, huge key. I mean, anybody that's a parent recognizes that there's one thing you want your kids to be more than anything else, and that is honestly regulating. So um, as we tie this into empathy today, I mean, I think it, it's worth considering that there are really three aspects that interrelate a lot. So we have empathy, the focus of our series. We also think about emotional regulation. And we also, the other aspect is kind of the level of endurance or energy that we have. And one of the things I definitely see with my kids, and I, I think of myself as a parent, is that the degree of energy I've got and the level of emotional regulation that I have directly affects, to be honest, how empathetic I feel in any given situation, right? And you could argue the same way. And in other ways, you could say, well, the more empathetic I am, the more regulated I'm probably going to be towards my kids and even be able to summon up some of the energy that I might want in general. And so it's a real key always that whenever we go after one variable, we always have to consider how other variables play into that. And um, it certainly really, really uh, kind of comes home when we talk today about this chapter five, this idea that empathetic children really can keep their cool overall. So I'm gonna pass it to Jamie at this point as we continue to talk more. Yeah, so I think this is this is a big piece of it. And the past couple of sessions, the past couple of weeks, we've kind of been talking about the building blocks of empathy and what skills we as parents and what our like what can teach our kids. Um, and I think this idea of being able to master and manage big emotions builds on this idea of emotional um, literacy and that we can talk about the feeling, right? We can name the feeling. And then once we can name it and talk about it, what do we do with it? How can we make sure the feeling doesn't control us? Um, and the chapter starts in a really interesting way. And it talks about just how stressed our society is. Um, we see this across the board, adults, kids, everybody is stressed all the time. There's some research that she cites that um, kids these days are as stressed as adults, which was really shocking for me to read because I think about even myself as a child, but walking into a school building and really thinking, you know, there shouldn't be the weight of the world on these kids, right? They should be allowed to be kids, but media and technology and just the state of our society really exposes our kids to a lot of extra stress. And this idea is really key because when we are constantly as humans living in a state of really high stress, it's really hard to have good emotion regulation. We think a lot about we, well, I say we, as a psychologist in training and learning growing up or being trained in school psychology, we talk a lot about flipping your lid. And we use this idea with kids where we kind of expose this part of our brain. This is kind of the emotion center of our brain. We think about the brain like this. Um, and that the more stressed we are, the quicker it is to flip and we kind of lose all of our planning, attention, regulation, things like that. Um, and this is for a lot of reasons. Our society isn't just one thing that makes it this way. But when we're stressed, it not only affects our actual brain functioning in terms of emotion regulation, it also can really affect our kids academically, socially. And it's a really important piece to think about how we're helping our kids cope and regulate not only all emotions, but especially their level of stress. I was thinking about this, Jamie, because we are fortunate to live in a place today where you have so many activities available to you for you and your kids, right? We have all these opportunities that many people across the world would love to have. But like you're saying, what comes with that sometimes is this go, 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 go mentality. And I do think that, you know, as one part of this conversation today in regards to creating more regulated kids so they can be more empathetic, 
we really have to think as parents, like, I need to step back and ask myself, how much of this is necessary? Like, you know, one of the examples of that, and I know there's a lot of pressure for parents in this domain, is that we love sports and our kids are involved in sports. But my wife and I made the decision early on that for the most part, our kids wouldn't start sports until fourth grade. And that wasn't an easy decision because, I mean, there was a lot available. You feel the pressure to get your kids started. But we kind of, you know, we had others that I think kind of mentored us in this way. And we recognized that once you get started with something like that, it's hard to pull back on it. And so what we didn't feel like was ultimately necessary was being part of all sorts of sports leagues and that we could do things at home. And, and so I think part of this discussion today is to make sure that we aren't kind of creating some of our own problems by some of the unnecessary activities that we really don't have to do. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring that up because another big piece of what Dr. Borba talks about and something I didn't really realize had a name until she named it was this idea of cognitive hype. And I think kids in my generation and maybe yours and definitely younger generations, I I feel like I remember my parents saying there's just so much more stress on you related to what you're expected to do. And I think for a long time, the thinking among psychologists, scientists, doctors was that in order to breed success in our kids, we need to really, really get them to do as much as possible. Yes, these emotion things are important, but they're not teachable. They're just kind of there. Your kid's a difficult kid. Your kid's an anxious kid. What's more important is how many activities can they be in? How much can we teach them academically and things like that? But what the research is finally starting to show is that number one, these skills are absolutely teachable. And not only that, kids can learn them at a really young age, but number two, more than um, IQ or SES or race, what predicts achievement and success and happiness in kids is their overall um, ability to regulate and be mindful with their emotions. And healthy emotional functioning is absolutely key to success, however you define it in, in any way. And that is a huge finding for us to consider. And you know, we yeah. see that all the way back from preschool age and you know, as kids kind of grow throughout that, like you said, emotional regulation, emotional literacy predicts outcomes of all outcomes that we want more than even those other areas. But here's the interesting thing. I know that you feel this way and I think others do, you know, while we'll spend thousands of hours teaching reading and we'll spend thousands of hours, like, you know, instructing or having our kids do other things. This is why we're doing this series in many ways, because we actually don't spend that much time at all in a more intentional way, teaching the very skill that we are saying predicts the outcomes we want, right? Or, or in the opposite way, predicts the outcomes that we don't really want there. So it's so important that we consider that in our parenting um, as we're going through that stage. Right. Well, and I don't want to harp too much on the research because I think that kind of statement says it all. And, and what I hope that Jim and I have kind of said throughout this is that this is important. And not only does the data and research show, but our experience as psychologists and Jim's experience as a parent of kids in all different stages of of development is that we can see these things playing out and you guys can see these things daily, you know, in your lives. So what I want to kind of talk more about today is first of all, what does self-regulation mean? Um, And then also what are some practical ways that you guys can kind of teach yourselves how to teach your kids these these things um, and what it will look like hopefully in your families Now, I'll give the disclaimer that my dissertation was on self-regulation, so I can be a little bit of a nerd when it comes to these things. I'm going to try really hard to keep it to my notes (laughs) and not go into the hundreds of pages of research that I've consumed, but self-regulation can be a really broad term, and it encompasses a lot of different things, but essentially that it's, it's this ability to regulate what's going on inside and not immediately react and behave as your initial instinct does. And this is a skill that naturally through development is not a, something that kids are born knowing how to do. Um, as many of you know, the brain develops from the back forward and a lot of these regulation abilities are held in the front of the brain. So we can't expect young kids to automatically be able to do this without us teaching them. Doesn't mean they can't learn it, but they're not gonna be thinking about the consequences. They're not gonna know the problem solving steps. So this is where we have to be really intentional. Now, 
There's self-awareness, which is kind of what we already talked about with this idea of what am I feeling? How do I feel? How do I know I'm feeling this way? Then there's, and that's kind of self-awareness and the emotional literacy of like having the language to talk about what I'm feeling and what I'm doing. Um, then there's self-management, which is the actual behavioral management piece of, okay, I want to slap my brother, but maybe I'm not going to make that choice. And how we kind of put those two things together is through problem solving. And there's a really great way to do this. It's not always, you know, first I state the problem, then I state how I feel. And then I come together with the person I have a problem with. And Jim can probably share numerous examples of conflicts with his kids and how they problem solve that or within the whole family. But just being aware that like the emotions are on one side, the solutions on the other, and the problem solving piece really brings those two things together. But we have to be able to do, um, we have to be able to keep our emotions in check in order to come to a problem or come to a solution that isn't charged with emotion and is appropriate. Uh, And I like that idea of the sense that it's hard to regulate what you don't know, right? So if you don't have the awareness in the first place, it's hard to manage it there. And I think that's where it's really important for us as parents that let's say our kid gets angry about not going to the zoo, like they've been promised to do it rains that day or whatever. It's important for us to say, Hey, before you were angry, I kind of wonder if you were maybe disappointed. I wonder if you were feeling, you know, like kind of let down and to help them see the awareness is like, Oh yeah. Like anger doesn't just necessarily come in by itself. Maybe there were other things that were driving it or you were feeling sad um, that level of awareness is just critical. I mean, on all at all ages, but especially for young kids who are just learning how that they even see the possibility of regulating their emotions. Because the younger they are, that's not even a you know possibility for many of them there. So, right, and we have to meet our kids where they're at. And there's a number of reasons why we don't expect a four year old to spontaneously generate, I'm feeling angry right now because we can't go to the zoo, but this is where that modeling piece comes into play and parents can kind of read the signs in their kids. And that's one of the big keys across this whole series is that idea of tuning in to your kids because you can't effectively coach or help them learn these skills. If you're not aware of those precursor behaviors or ongoing concerns for them. So tuning in by really helping yourself see them without phones, without distractions and, and looking at them and seeing, I can tell my kids stress because they're picking their fingernails. You'd be surprised how many parents don't know what their kids stressed behaviors are. We all do them. Some kids play with their hair, pick their fingernails, you know, stick out their tongue. And some parents have no clue that that can be related to anxiety. The same thing goes with angry behaviors. You know, I can tell my kids about to get angry because of their face or they just shut down completely. And so being able to tune in to the signals that your kid is giving you um, really helps you gain awareness of them as well. And you can kind of then teach them what those body alarms are essentially. It goes back to what we were saying last week is that when it's an emotional situation, not a behavioral situation, the emotional situations are really ripe for teaching, right? And recently, one of my kids um, who tends to get defensive when he feels like the chores are being assigned unfairly or he's being blamed or whatever, we've been talking a lot about like what are the mannerisms, what are the things that show that defensiveness, things that he really isn't that aware of. But we're trying to increasingly say, hey, notice when you do this, when your kind of body does this and your voice kind of ramps up, you see how that is. And let's really work on kind of pulling back and it's okay to be upset, but recognize your own response and dysregulation as it's coming. And so that's a great, you know, those are good examples of like teaching situations that aren't behavioral, but rather just opportunities here. And then the goal is that when you are able to meet your child in that moment before there is an actual behavioral issue, then you don't have to wonder how do I manage a behavioral situation that actually is emotional because we're not hitting, we're not screaming, we're not throwing things, in which case, you know, there are severe behaviors where we do have to put them in timeout or really, you know, consider the behavior as important. We can't be hurting other kids, but if we can hopefully help identify the feeling before, then we can engage in those problem solving situations of what's a better way to deal and manage that self-management, this feeling. 
you know, the other thing we can do in this, in using the same example I just provided is we can also address language that unfairly and um, inaccurately communicates something that's not occurring. So like in the situation I was describing, you know, a, a typical response might be like, I always have to do this. I'm always the one that gets sent outside, you know, to do this, whatever. And so when you hear those words, like always, right, number one, it's important, like in that moment to say, no, hold on. Remember, language is, like, language is power. It teaches you something. So when you hear yourself say always, what's that telling, you know, what's that telling yourself? And so that's, I think, where you can also kind of catch the language that starts to like basically support dysregulation. The other thing though, you can kind of catch is the sense of how that rising up and that language doesn't support empathy to say, now remember it was yesterday that your brother actually you know, walked down. We have tortoises at our house. <laughs> and actually remember he was the one yesterday that gave, you know, Mortis the food or whatever. And that came up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah whatever. And you can start to kind of like, again, address ways in which that reactive response is not only not accurate, but also then it's not empathetic. Um, it really is, Jamie, I think so much as we talk about this, it's really using those moments there. Now, and again, think of all the thousands of hours that we use the moments to drive our kids to soccer practice and everything else. That's understandable, but are we using the moments in our kids' lives when you could say, wow, I could teach you better self-regulation which could serve you better in all domains of your life more than anything else. And am I using that? And we're not always going to be able to use those moments, but when they're there, it's great to take advantage of that. It's funny. You're talking about the, the use of language, which has come up, you know, as it always does. But um, I think about my own training as a psychologist and how tuning into language has really changed the way I think about a lot of different things and how intimidating it is at the beginning to feel like you have to catch every single thing right. a client says that's like, Oh, this is a signal of this dis disorder or this thought pattern. And it can feel very overwhelming. Cause it's like, I'm constantly having, I'm not even really listening. I'm just like, what are they saying? And how is that relating to what I need to do next? And we don't want that to be the case here because we actually want to model that idea of empathetic listening that we've talked about a while ago, which is you're actively listening, you're reflecting and labeling the feeling and summarizing, right? We're not trying to invalidate by saying like, no, you still have to go do the chore and you don't have any right to be upset because your brother did it yesterday. But more so this idea of like, now notice when you say always, you're discounting the experience of your brother. And hey, again, it's okay to be upset yep. and it's okay to be angry that you have to go out when it's raining. But when you say these things, it's not helping you feel better. What's a way you can help yourself feel better because it's okay to be upset. Yeah. And remember, and I, I feel like we say this every week, but it's so true. You're not going to catch every moment. You're going to be you know, too tired. You're not going to be able to tune in appropriately, or you're going to have three other kids who are also not having a good day. Um, and there's always going to be moments missed, just like there's always parts of session that I'm like, looking back, I could have said something, you know, about that thought, but we were on the other thought. And it's just a game of like making you as a parent more aware of those situations so that when they do arise, you're more equipped to take action than to wait until after and say, oh, that would have been a great opportunity. And I just wasn't even, it wasn't even on my mind at all. And that's what I know you're going to talk today about mindfulness and that idea is yeah. it's really actually for all of us. It's just kind of being more mindful of the situation that you're in. And I think when we as parents are able to be more mindful of what's occur occurring and we're more regulated, then we start to see things as more opportunities and not something like, oh, just, I just got to get through this. Right. And we've all been there where we just want to get through and go to bed at night because it's been a rough day and there's nothing wrong with that. But I, parenting becomes more enjoyable and more, um, I think, fruitful and rewarding when you feel like you can use the moments better than you have before. And I think, so as we kind of move in to talk about mindfulness, it is one of those things that for a very long time, I didn't really understand. And I don't think I understand as well as a lot of experts in the field. I don't use it as much as I wish I did in my own personal life. But what I can say is that the research is there. It's a hundred percent there. The Dr. Borba in the book talks about a really interesting study and I won't go over the whole thing. It's, it's a really interesting part of this chapter, but essentially there's these studies they've done with 
monks, religious um, individuals who engage in mindfulness um, periodically, regularly for 30, 40, 50 years and compare their responses in emotionally charged situations with typical people who don't use this skill, but maybe even are otherwise healthy. And even then we know based on imaging of the brain that the brain looks different. The brain is processing that information differently and the brain is better at concentration and overall mental capacities to do all different kinds of things. And so mindfulness does lead to better emotion regulation. Again, these are people who've been doing it for 30 years. So when tomorrow you go to pull up a video and you're like, this is exhausting. I've done five minutes and I cannot do any more listening to myself breathe again, 30 years, one day. That's how I feel sometimes. I'm like, I, it's been five minutes and I need to stop. But just this idea that the more we're able to tune into the present moment, the less likely we are to be lost or distracted or overcome by the external forces or even the things inside of us that are not appropriate for the situation, like really big, strong feelings. Yeah, you're right. And, and then the more you tune into the present moment, the more you start to again see, like, even if it's been a really rough day, this actually is a good moment where I could feel good about how this interaction went, right? That, that's kind of the neat thing about all of this is that it's, we're going to expect that things are going to be difficult, but we're not like, what we're saying is not predicated on, oh, having a great week that it builds up to this, or the day has been great to build up to this. What we're saying is that you start to kind of like pull apart the pieces of your day as a parent. And you're like, irregardless, oh yeah, that piece was challenging. Oh yeah, this is going on. Oh, but here I find myself and I've got a little bit of time with my kid. And you know what? Like that was kind of neat because we interacted around something that was important. Um, and, and in the world of distractions, right? Anything that's important and we can interact around that is even better. And so um, I think, like you said, mindfulness can be hard to capture and sometimes in and of itself even feel maybe too pressurized, but at its core, it's just the sense of saying, hey, we're going to be much more present-minded people and parents. And, and what I found as a parent, again, having a number of kids is that it also puts you a little bit more ease, you know, instead of looking at my day and thinking there is no way I'm getting through this next 12 hours plus before I go to bed, it's saying, oh, right now as a parent or as a professional, this is where I need to really be and where my focus needs to be. And that's a whole lot more peaceful to think, well, this is all I have to take care of right now and putting my heart and soul into it. And then we'll move on to other things. So I think part of mindfulness is actually just the perspective itself, not even necessarily the mechanisms and the, the perspective right. of saying I'm a more of a present focused parent. It doesn't mean I don't plan for tomorrow and take care of all that stuff. But when it comes to my own emotional state, when you find that your emotional state is here in the present moment, you're also going to find yourself being more empathetic and regulated too, for sure. Right. And absolutely. I think what you said at the very end is really important and key to remember across the board. It's not that we, oh, whatever happened before doesn't matter or whatever happen, happens next isn't important. What it means though is right now we're honoring where we are. It makes me think of that quote that I feel like you mm -hmm. monthly are talking to me about. It's the, the honor yeah. the present your present duty, bear your present pain, enjoy your present pleasure, and let those emotions and experiences take care of themselves. And as we always say, it's hard to execute that. But what's very freeing about that is to say, if I take that approach to things, then you're saying I only have to really focus on this right now. Yeah, that's and that's what we're saying. And so as we know, the emotions and experiences are always going to come. But the less I try to control those things, which are hard to control, and more, and this is what we're doing here, Jamie, it's like, the more I take ownership over things that I actually can have an impact on, then, you know, what you find for parents like myself is that, you know, years ago, the thought of having again, eight kids would have been, would have floored me as impossible. But now the reality is I don't have to have eight kids all at once doing everything at one time. I just have to do one thing at one time with each of the children that, you know, needs to occur. And that's much more freeing there. So, right. And it makes me think about this idea that, again, we talk about at the beginning, I talked about the stress and the really intense, you know, media exposure and technology and all of these barriers. But at the end of the day, as a parent, you can't control what happens to your kid when they walk out of the house in the morning. You can't control what happens to you when you walk out of the house, when you get in the car, when you walk into work, right? So this is less about trying to exert more control and more about 
having the ability to acknowledge that you can't control something and work with what you have in a way that's not, you know, kind of covered in this idea of stress and emotion um, and being able to regulate as those present emotions and things come and go and ebb and flow throughout your day. Yeah. And so very simple thing might be in the moment when you start to feel your child's getting upset and you start to feel your own regulation, maybe kind of, you know, increasing negatively to say, Hey, hold on. Let's just, why don't we, why don't we breathe together here for a few minutes? Cause I can feel us kind of getting upset. And before we do anything else, why don't we, you know, again, we talk about belly breathing and other kinds of things, but why don't we breathe together for a couple of seconds and then let's just hold on. Right. And that's kind of the beauty of it is regulation. As we often teach our very young kids, we talk about STA skills. We teach them how to stop and we're like stopping, meaning freeze mind and body just briefly and think, think, okay, so what might happen if I do this and who might this affect before we move into the action there? And literally, as you can help in a behavioral sense, do that with your child. So from a neurological sense, like you've been talking, Jamie, that they will increasingly inherit that the way they process things there. And breathing, it just, it sounds so simple and it it really is. It truly, when you are able to slow down your breathing, your brain and your whole physiology, your whole body, your whole nervous system respond to that. And it, it, it's honestly miraculous in some ways to think something so simple can really trigger such an intense response from your nervous system to say, I'm really, really amped up. I'm really got this really intense reaction to something, but if I'm able to calm and really re-engage this other piece of my nervous system, that's kind of not working right now, if we're able to kind of put that piece away and say, it's time to just re-engage the calming part of our body, how much clearer and more able we are to function. There's so many videos and apps and things online that you can use to teach yourself these skills. It is amazing. And I will be the first to admit that I did not know what belly breathing was before I entered graduate school. I just assumed breathing was breathing. And unless you are trained in vocal, you know, opera singing, you may not either. You may think I'm breathing, but there's some really cool videos online I've used with adults and they have several for kids as well on what it actually means to take a deep breath that goes into your belly. And there's some really, you know, easy tips to think about breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth can help you slow breaths down, trying as a parent or an adult, trying to make your exhale twice as long as your inhale working your way up to those things. Breathing is more complicated than just in and out, in and out. Um, But just those simple skills of being able to stop and do this to kind of regulate your nervous system. It really is incredible how quickly and easily you can learn to make that just a natural habit for you and your whole family. Well, as we're coming to the end of our time, I had one last thought that you made that kind of popped in my mind as you said all this. And I think that this will be my, my last thought for, for parents like ourselves who are busy and we want to help our kids regulate better is think of all the times that we celebrate lots of things our kids do, right? Maybe they get, you know, get good grades or something goes well athletically or they're you know, in band and they do things um, well there. We, you know, we like to celebrate that. But what it would be a really cool thing if we as parents increasingly celebrated growth in emotional awareness and regulation. Like, wow, this is really cool. You know, I feel like together we're getting better at handling our emotions and understanding them. And that's really, really, really cool. And that might sound kind of like, you know, a little dorkish and a little Pollyannish, but the reality is actually what we give credence to and what we celebrate communicates as a family, what's actually important, right? So if we don't celebrate growth in this area or acknowledging things in this area, then how are our kids necessarily going to see it as something important, right? Yeah, definitely. With that, I think we'll sign off for today and thanks so much for being a part of our series. We appreciate it.